Hello and welcome to the Knowing Self, Knowing Others podcast, where we discuss self-aware leadership with thinkers from around the globe. I'm your host, Nia Thomas. Join me as we talk to today's guest. A very big welcome to today's guest, Adrian Ashton. He's an award-winning freelance enterprise and charity consultant and Cambridge graduate. Adrian began his career at one of the UK's top public relations consultancies before leading various social enterprises. His leadership turned a struggling support agency into a nationally acclaimed body, earning recognition from the Department of Trade and Industry and the Bank of England. Adrian's work has positively impacted local and national projects, and he frequently contributes to national and regional publications. He holds advanced qualifications in business advice and coaching and is a fellow of several prestigious institutions, including the RSA, the Royal Society of Arts, where Adrian and I bumped into each other. He's committed to ethical business practices, and Adrian is accredited by the Good Business Charter. He's also a Lego Serious Play practitioner. He is a signatory to the Charter for Inclusive Entrepreneurship and the Armed Forces Covenant. He remains a champion of inclusivity and responsible businesses within the UK enterprise ecosystem. Adrian, a very big welcome. Hello. Um, is that it for the? Is that all the time we've got for this podcast? That sounds like um, <laughs> it's quite a lot to fit in there, wasn't it? It's, gosh, it, it always feels strange when someone goes over your resume for you, and you kind of go, "Did I do that? Have I? Is that me? Are they really?" Well, my mum will be really pleased when she hears you saying all Amazing. that afterwards. So, thank you. Good, good, indeed. So tell us a little bit about your career journey. Sure. Um, so I guess, well, I was thinking about this earlier. So I'm one of those awkward kids at school when the careers advisor said, what do you want to be? You know, And all the teachers said, you do this subject and you'll be really good at doing that. I never had that goal. I never had that, that germ to go, I'm going to be an astronaut or a train driver or something like that, you know, it's always just a case of I'll just bumble along. You know, this mm-hmm. this looks interesting. This seems fun. I'll try this out next. And that kind of led me in terms of the qualifications I did at school and college and university. But then after I came out of college, like I said, I started off in the, the PR sort of world, corporate public relations, marketing, um, decided very quickly that that particular way of working wasn't quite right for me. Again, no strong aspirations, no clear sense of what is my dream job. So I was very fortunate. I was able to temp. So Cambridge, a beautiful city, lots of odd things about it. One of which is technically there is negative unemployment because because of the local economy, because of the housing market there and all the rest, there's actually more jobs than there are because people can't afford to take the jobs for the pay they've got against the cost of living there. Now, I was very fortunate. My parents were living in Cambridge and still are. Hello, mum and dad. So I was able to kind of bunk with them uh, for a little bit. So I attempted, I tried out all of these different jobs, worked across loads of different industries. And that was really instructive, really enjoyed that. And then from that, started to be approached to say, could you get involved with being involved with this company? Could And then progressively, I obviously showed some aptitude. People liked it and up I went. And that sense, I think, uh, near though of saying, okay, universe, what should I try next? And being open to stuff, not saying I've got to do this with a laser focus, saying, okay, let's try this out, has meant I've had all of these different opportunities and adventures. I've, like I said, I've gained this reputation um, sort of internationally of, of being a sort of leading authority around the world of social enterprises. Accidentally wrote a book, which I think you might be asking me about later. I might. Accidentally changed company law. Um, without any legal qualification or training. And I kind of, I can hear myself going that a lot of these things start with the word, I accidentally did it because I think there's that sense of, if we're just open to stuff, let's try it out. Let's see where it goes. It's a happy, like Bob Ross, the painter, it's a happy accident. You know, let's just kind of see what we can take from it. So that's, I'm always kind of looking at it that way and saying, well, you know, what might be next? Absolutely. Fascinating how your journey has sort of meandered through. And you've talked about very practical operational roles that you have done, but the way you have done them, I guess, has very much led to what you talk about in your book, because your book is about imposter syndrome. So I often talk about what my job is, is a director of a children's charity, and how I do it is self-aware leadership. What you do is all of those different elements around social enterprise um, and business development and support, but how you do it is with an understanding of imposter syndrome. 
So tell us about your particular interest in imposter syndrome and, and starting by defining it for us. Yeah, sure. So I've always kind of had this idea, and I've said to people that um, syndrome, some people call it self-doubt. Some people would argue they're different things. I think there's a lot of commonality between those two kind of lands. Um, I've always kind of referred to imposter syndrome as the gremlin of doubt. It's that thing that sits on your shoulder and you can normally ignore it. It's normally not a problem. But every so often, and usually at about three o'clock in the morning, when you're having trouble sleeping, it will wake you up and it will whisper in your ear incessantly, you're going to duck it up. People are going to find you out. It's all going to go horribly wrong. Your life's, you're going to show yourself up. You're going to ruin everything you thought for happiness. And because it's three o'clock in the morning, you've got nowhere to go, no one to talk to. And it just takes over. So in terms of imposter syndrome, I've got this hunch about it, Mm -hmm. that the more you know what you don't know, the more likely you are to develop an imposter syndrome. So when I was researching self-awareness, it became evident that the more self-aware you become, the more you realise how little you know. And this is Socrates and Plato. And and this is something that's an idea that's been around for a very, very long time. How do you see imposter syndrome in terms of awareness and and why does it happen? What do you do with it? Where do you go with it? Mm, No, for sure. I think self-awareness is important because like Shakespeare, you know, we talked about the the classic philosophers. We have the more contemporary like Shakespeare. Know know the self, but not too well. This is kind of his warning to us, that sense of it's important to be aware of and honest with ourselves. Let's not overreach Let's uh, be be mindful. Let's be practical. Let's not set ourselves up to fail through that awareness, that that journey of self-awareness. And self-awareness, I think, is ultimately about accepting and embracing and knowing how other people see us. We're not believing our own hype. We start to go, oh, actually, this is how I come across and this is how people see me. Okay, that bit's fine. My idea at the moment, uh, at this point in time here, is that's quite dangerous, though, like you say, because... If we're not careful, that journey of self-awareness is often quite insular. It's quite isolated. Mm-hmm. We don't really do it as, as part of a tribal group of other people. So we start to get caught in an echo chamber of our own head. And therefore, we suddenly have this little idea that goes, oh, oh what, what if I really am like that? And there's no one around to break that cycle to say, actually, that's okay, because look at these things over here. You're not. You're safe. We just spin it out and it echoes around our head it gets louder just like on social media you know we have the social media algorithms the, the whatever social media channel we're on the algorithm says let's show you more of what you are thinking about and it yeah. doesn't break that habit you know it encourages you to, to dig that so that self-awareness is important but we need to practice it in a way that makes us more open and, and accountable with it to other people around us and that's a scary very scary thing I would definitely agree. And and when people have asked me the question, is, is it possible that self-awareness, you can be too self-aware? And my response is when self-awareness gets stuck in overthinking and rumination, then it is not helpful. So I think for me, self-awareness, it's perpetual motion. You have yeah. to move forward. You have to learn from it. You have to make the decision to change or not. And you have to keep going to the next thing. And yeah. and, and I agree. So in terms of imposter syndrome, do you think that there's a, an element of stuckness like you've described in imposter syndrome? Yes. Okay. Uh, maybe this is something we'll, we'll kind of come back to from a few different angles in a few minutes. But I think very often there's an element of being stuck that says, I don't know how to get out of this. You know, be, because we've, as a society, we're not very good at understanding how we think or why we think like that or how we manage our our thought processes and feelings so we don't know where to go for that support we kind of go oh I'm supposed to go and see a specialist counselor or a coach who specializes in this sort of thing but then how can I afford that and am I going to understand what they say because this is sounds all really technical and but alongside I think it's a flip side though as well Neil which is I think there's also something which is if someone says for some people if they go oh I've got imposter syndrome they wear it almost as a badge of honour, which That's is the sense of, mm, okay, but bear with me, okay? There's, there's, okay, a, okay. There's, there's, there's half a thought behind this at the moment. Um, if I've got imposter syndrome, that gives me a get-out-of-jail-free card. 
if we're putting right. up, okay? okay? I've got imposter syndrome, so I can't possibly put myself forward for that. And because I say it openly and I own it, then people won't expect me to push things further. They'll go, okay, they're struggling. They've got imposter syndrome. Let's leave them be. You're kind wow. of, you're in your comfort space and no one's challenging you in that because you're saying, I don't want you to challenge me. I'm using this label, this badge as a shield not to challenge myself, not to change, not to grow or develop or become more of what I could be to realize my potential. And that I, I think increasingly is understandable. And I have some sympathy for that because if we look around the wide world, it's a chuffing, scary place, mm -hmm. incredibly. Okay, I, More and more, I'm hearing people advocate saying, um, take a break from the news. Don't watch the news yeah. because it's too depressing. It's too overwhelming. And I, I, I can understand that. But at the same time, I think that's a shame because if you're not aware of what's going on in society around you, how can you hope to actually forge a path through that? How can you hope to bridge and build and nurture relationships with other people who are in that. So it's finding that balance. I think that sense of overwhelm we're increasingly feeling. We're seeing more stuff. We're hearing more stuff. Social media algorithms are amplifying this. And to kind of go, I've now got to change myself as well. All of the things that I thought were stable, all of the things I thought I knew, that's just too much to cope. So if I now have to become someone I didn't think I was, I can't cope with that as well. And it becomes a safety mechanism. So. You know, one of my ideas about imposter syndrome is it's part of a human condition. It's a safety check. You know, for example, it may be really cool to go and climb Mount Everest with nothing but a box of toothpicks and a spare pair of socks. Mm -hmm. But your brain kicks in and says, hang on a minute, sanity check, safety check. Are you sure? And this is kind of that self-doubt imposter syndrome thing, which is, are we really sure we're about to do this? It's not our brain saying, don't do it. It's our brain saying, is this in this moment an acceptable risk to help us stay alive? So I think all of this stuff's kind of floating around us. It's this sense of who we are, our identities as human beings, the pace of change in society, media communications, pressures. And it's completely understandable when people go, I want to get off. I want to time out. So to say this, I've got imposter syndrome, gives them what seems like a legitimate ticket to step away just to protect themselves for a little bit. But then they get stuck. That's where that stuckness comes, because then nobody goes back to check in and say, OK, do you still want to be in the imposter syndrome timeout room or do you okay. now want to come back and play with the rest of us? So I, I guess I would challenge that because I wonder then if there is a difference between real imposter syndrome and a, an individual who feels it and senses it versus somebody who maybe is facing burnout, has learned a bit about mm -hmm. imposter syndrome and is now thinking that might just help me to cope. And and as you say, using it as a as that yeah. ticket to people understand what it means. Maybe I, I can take a step back because if I use this, it helps me get where I need to be. Yeah, yeah. Versus uh, yeah. you know that real imposter syndrome. If that's not a contradiction in terms. Uh, no, absolutely. I think we, that's and and actually that's probably quite a safe, wise thing to do on on that per, on a person's part mm. to say, let me use the languages, the labels, the resources that other people can understand and hear yeah. that will allow them to give me the space I need without constantly putting on more expectation. It gives me that chance just to, to become safer, to, to become, regain my health uh, in terms of to get off the wheel for a little bit. I think that phrase of, is it, is, is it a real imposter syndrome or is it an imagined imposter syndrome? The work that I did in terms of researching for the book, as I went around all this is, I've looked at kind of various research studies that were done and the original 1970s paper by, by Clance and Inns, imposter phenomenon, as they called it then. Mm -hmm. And actually looking at all of that, I'm, I'm coming to the idea that imposter syndrome was never a real thing. And it isn't a real thing. Okay. It's, um, it's a misdescription of this idea of that kind of sanity check that our brain's going saying, is this an okay place for us to be in? Is this a safe place for us to be in? And the way that we do that, the way that we, you know, we look to that is, can we see people like us here? You know, again, we're social creatures. We're always looking for affirmation, reassurance points. I'm walking into a room full of women. I'm a bloke. Is this a safe place for me to be? Should I be here? I don't see other men. So immediately I'm missing the cues about I feel like I belong here because I don't see anyone else like him because very glib generalization that I'm aware. And this is kind of what the original paper came out with, which was 
Clance and Innes did the paper in the 70s and said, it's a really interesting study, by the way, if you, for any researcher, <laughs> Clance and Innes said, these, you know, we've come across women who are feeling that they don't belong in their jobs. Paraphrasing horribly here. Uh, but the, the gist was, so we'll do a study into this. Let's understand it better. So they put a call out and said, if you are a woman in a senior management role and you don't think you belong there, can you come and talk to us? Because we want, we want to research this. Uh -huh. They didn't ask men and they didn't ask anyone who didn't have those feelings. So there's no control groups. There's no comparison groups. So you kind of go well, on that basis as a research paper. Of course, you were going to find people saying that. And of course, it was going to be women doing it. And that's where this kind of thing perpetuated from. It only affects women in management because that was the first oh. study. That's the first control group, right, the first okay. cohort. Now, interestingly, what they kind of came out with was that. So, well, why do you feel this? Why do you feel you don't belong? And what kind of came out was women were saying, because we don't really see any other women in management roles with us, with that with that vanguard group. And I think we see this here. If we, we talk to anyone who's saying, I'm feeling like a bit of an imposter. I don't feel I belong here. My idea is if we start to have those conversations with people gently and, and with care and respect, um, that they start to say, well, because I don't see anyone else here who's my age. I don't see anyone else here who has tattoos. I don't see anyone else here who, you know, has earbuds in most of the day. So because there's that lack of affirmation, we're not, again, there's feedback. We're a social creature. We're constantly looking for safety. Mm -hmm. How do we know this is a safe place to be? Where's our cues? We don't see them. So immediately our brain's going, are you sure you belong here? Is this a safe place to be? Maybe you need to get out. And that's why we kind of need those points of, of interruption to say if we bring, if we're inviting someone to our community or our team or our workplace or whatever it is. And we look kind of go, actually, there's no one like them here. Our first point should be let's have a conversation with them to help them understand why and to work with them to say, well, how can they help us change that in the future? The first person out there is always feeling like a fraud and imposter. Because they're breaking new ground. How do I know this is the right thing to do? I came across an interview that Einstein gave. Um, but basically, because he was, he was at such a cutting edge of physics and science and all the rest, he actually gave an interview where he got asked about it. And he said something like, you know, I'm just making this out. None of this is my work. I'm just building on everything people came before me. I just got lucky. But everyone goes, no, this, this Einstein, you're great. You got this. He was breaking new ground. He saw no one else like him. And in getting it, he was just, and he tried to manage that and he overplayed it. So that's why, you know, famously, he always messed his hair up. He stuck his tongue out in photographs. He was trying to distract from this fact that he didn't feel he belonged. He didn't have the classical education background that all the other physicists did. So he was deliberately trying to kind of find ways to make himself feel safe in that. Um, gosh, this is kind of like pop psychology on famous dead scientists all of a sudden, isn't it? Uh, that's maybe that's another spin off show for next time. <laughs> Indeed. Um, I'm interested, you talked about that research and it almost sounds mm. like it was a self-fulfilling prophecy yeah. because if, if you ask yeah. you know, people that you know, wear glasses about wearing glasses, they're going to tell you about wearing mm. glasses. That's yeah. the way it is. Have you found that there is more modern research that has expanded the, the people that, that are in that research pool yeah is there something new in terms of yeah, that research yeah, sure. so so when i did the book one of the things I was, I was very keen to do was to get people to challenge my workings out in it so in the back of the book i've got one of the appendices is from the, the, the first book all of the the references all of the research papers all of the studies all of the articles so people can go and look them up you know you can kind of go look at what i looked at read what i read and then decide have i misunderstood it? and if you have you know i kind of say please come back and I keep saying I'm trying to work on the second edition and the universe keeps distracting me with other things. But, you know, I want to build on this and I want to test it. But as I went through this new as well, I kind of looked at, tried to look at other places and I tried to avoid blog posts if I could, because what I was noticing was blog posts tended to reaffirm this kind of the same messages, which was about, oh, there are seven types of imposter or whatever it is. There are these things you do and, there was, there was very, none of them really made any referencing. None of them said, this is what it's based on. And I've always been interested. What's the evidence and the research for this position if I'm going to live my life by it? So I went back to academic journals and studies. And in more recent years, there's been this trend. And what's come out is saying men and women are equally likely to feel this kind of spectre of imposterism. It's just that women seem to be open about talking about it more. Now, now I think 
and I have an idea about that, which is if you, you go in the libraries, Amazon, whatever, you look for books on imposter syndrome, who have they been, been written by? Usually women. Who are they written for? Usually women. If you go to any panel debate or discussion or event talking about imposter syndrome, who's normally speaking on it exclusively? Women. Who are they aiming their talk at? So we've kind of got this self-fulfilling prophecy again that's kind of laid on. So, But the evidence in the papers are starting to say, no, men are just as likely, but we don't, as a bloke, we don't feel able to be as open about it somehow. So that's um, that part. And then we talk about different roles and careers. Again, age doesn't seem to be a factor in this as well, according to these papers. You get it at any point in life. But then there's also this idea of, well, you know, we hear a lot about kind of young professionals, freelancers talking about imposter syndrome quite a lot. Maybe... Is this endemic to, to the gig economy work or the freelance mm. world? And again, I think it's that sense of, you know, how do people feel safe talking about this? Because if you're in a workplace, if you're salaried and employed, you're concerned that you don't lose favour with your boss. Your yeah. boss has said, I want to recruit you for this job because I think you're the best person for it. You don't want to risk your safety. Again, that human instinct, that kind of, you know, that could go back all those thousands of years, um, so you don't want to risk your safety. You don't want to put yourself at unnecessary risk. So even if you're feeling, oh, I'm really not sure about this, you're not going to out. You're not going to voice it because you don't feel it's safe to. If we're a freelancer, there are more communities of you know again more com- freelance communities you can shake a stick at these days, and it's all a safe space because it's only other freelancers in there. None of us are each other's clients, so we can say what we're really feeling. So again, this starts to build this self fulfilling prophecy of oh, all freelancers feel imposter syndrome because all freelancers talk about it. No, I think it's because freelancers find it easier because we have more safe spaces to do that. that. And actually, there was something interesting that came out last year. I was asked by by a national sector body. So I was chatting with one of their officers and they said, oh, really enjoyed reading your book. Um, I wondered, though, you know, I I was having this thought, do you think imposter syndrome is contagious? I said, okay, you know, just go, go with me. So I said, well, could it affect a whole organization rather than just the person? So I got that, yeah, this kind of got a thought thinking. So, okay, so we had a conversation and they agreed to, to broker some roundtable conversations with their member businesses. And we said, okay, but what we're going to do, we're going to get the chief execs of these member businesses around the tables. What came out was that all of these chief executives, and yeah, you know, I, I kind of struggle with my confidence. I struggle knowing if I'm making the right decision. I struggle being comfortable and relaxed that i'm the right person to be in this chair in this job and increasingly all of them said as well because i can't have these conversations normally i've never been able to have these conversations before because there is nowhere that allows me to do it safely so this was a really interesting thing that came out that says actually yeah if you're in the workplace everyone feels it but no one can say it because we're we've gamified the workplace and the relationships there seems to be then a uh some golden thread that goes from psychological safety to imposter syndrome and also what you're talking about uh, men being able to share their emotions men's health uh, men's mental health and mm-hmm. we know that men don't talk about their worries and their concerns in the same way that women do yeah. uh, there's there's definitely different threads connecting all of those things mm. and, and i think that's because we i've always had this idea near that um, we are messy things as human beings. And ultimately, everything is connected. If we try and yeah. do this stuff in silos, it doesn't work. We, yeah. Because nothing we do is ever truly in isolation from each other. You know, yeah. it, in terms of my, me and my family relationships, I am a parent to children. I am also a step parent. I am a husband. I am a divorcee. I am a child myself to my parents. I'm a sibling to my sister. These are all very different identities in a family unit, but I hold all of these at the same time. So if you start to say, well, let's think about how you develop your parenting skills. I can't do that in isolation from how I think about my relationship with my sister or my parents because Mm -hmm. they feed onto each other. Yeah. So this and you know the work I do as well with with businesses and charities and, and other government bodies, it's the sense of you know at the heart of it are people. Whatever you're working on, whatever your sector, your group, whatever, I'm working with a person, and this yeah. person has to work within systems and processes. But this person is also interwoven with other people. So again, the idea of threads and the and it's that idea of you know being acknowledging that, being respectful of it. And saying, okay, well, which threads can we 
pull on together and which threads do you feel you don't feel ready or willing to to kind of to do anything with let's leave that alone then trying to build that sense of safety for people to say great which bit are you okay talking about for now but be aware that you're gonna have to come back and deal with that bit later at some point otherwise this isn't gonna stick interesting that you talk about that connection between um my view is that self-awareness and leadership are both socially constructed concepts okay do you think that imposter syndrome is socially constructed yes oh okay on the basis that i have an idea and again this is just not me this is something i've come to from a few other conversations it's been weaponized imposter syndrome has been weaponized there's the the showstopper statement and again that's because if we look at um, you know, when was it quote unquote discovered? So in terms of what Clarence and Inns described in the 1970s, and you go back beyond that interviews with Einstein and other people through history, these feelings have always been around in us. They're not new. What Clarence and Inns did was they gave it a special name in a special context, the workplace at the end of the 1970s. So we go, okay, so what else was happening around that time? Again, yeah, this everything's connected, right? So again, at the 19, end of the 1970s, so we've got the first kind of women's lib movement in the 60s. That's kind of abating. The next wave's coming out of that. So women are now getting into established roles in management positions, which have historically been the purview of men. Mm-hmm. Men's position is being threatened, established workplaces. Yeah. It's understandable. When we feel threatened, we push back. Okay? It's just that it's a human, it's an instinctual response. If, if we're not aware of it, and this is often what happens, okay? So all of a sudden, so we start to see this thing of in the 1980s, it's, oh, imposter syndrome starts to be talked about more and more and more. Well, um, Google, interesting, uh, there's this, Google have an app called the N-Word, for you, one of the great Google apps, and they look at all the books that have ever been published by the title, and you put the, a word in, it says, this is the number of books that were published that year with this title. So you put in imposter syndrome, for example, and... Um, 1970s, not really much going on to expect. 1980s, a little bit. In the 1990s, it starts to spike. Books about self-doubt have always been there, but around the 1990s, it drops off. So you kind of go, okay, this is interesting. So again, this uh, reinforcing the message, it only affects women. You're struggling. You're not up to this. As men, we're immune to it. So we should keep these jobs, not you. So we start to see that those kind of power balances playing out. What I've also seen is I, I, some other roundtables I did again with the RSA with, that we mentioned about. Like the RSA very kindly invited me to do some other roundtables with some of their other fellows. And one of the things that came out of that as well, and I've always been careful when there's been these conversations, for me not to drop in these words or phrases. For other, and one of the things that came out of those was people saying, yeah, I've had this idea that it's been weaponized, that it's used yeah. as a mechanism to control other people in the workplace because people feel threatened by their colleagues they're trying to get ahead on the career ladder so if i keep the competition out i've got more chance of getting up and again like we said this idea that it's used as a badge to for a person to create safety for themselves it can also be used as a pointy stick to get other people to doubt themselves more or to sow a seed of doubt amongst their colleagues about them which means when the corporate reviews come around when it's time to promote people get pushed out again this idea of it's a real there's all these dimensions that i'm kind of the more that I'm, I'm researching the more conversations that are coming out the the kind of the messier it gets but the, also the more fascinating as this idea of a construct um in how we, we model it definitely and it makes me think just how important language is and i wonder if we instead of calling it imposter syndrome we started to call it conscientiousness i wonder what yeah. then would happen Because it feels like, again, going back to what my view, does it appear when there is greater self-awareness? Are we therefore identifying that we are more conscientious because Mm. we now realise what we don't know? Who knows? I think that language is what's so, um, and I can't believe I'm about to say this. um, Stephen Bartlett on his podcast a little while ago kind of had this, he did one of these skits about imposter syndrome. And he said a similar thing. He said, what if we didn't call it imposter syndrome, but we Mm. said, I'm having a growth opportunity moment yeah. because that feeling of self-doubt, I'm not really right to be here, means we're venturing mm. into new territory. We, we have the potential to become more. We're growing, we're developing, we're having to adapt. A growth moment, that's scary. Yeah. What if it, we, we said, I'm having a growth moment 
Wow, that, that would really flip things mm, around, wouldn't it? That, that language, what we call it, is really... And again, imposter syndrome, it was never called that. I'm still trying to find the exact moment and where it changed. The original paper, the, for the first few years, it was imposter phenomenal. They said that Clanton said, something unusual is happening here. It's a mm. phenomenon. It's something we're not quite sure how to explain or understand yet. And then somewhere along the way, it got called syndrome. It got medicalized which immediately says you need special treatment. It's beyond your control, which yeah. again links into this idea of weaponization. Weaponization, yeah. Oh, my goodness. It all fits, doesn't it? Ta-da! Dear listeners, you thought you were coming on a podcast about leadership and doubt and growth and awareness, and instead you've entered the world of conspiracy theories. <laughs> uh, well, here's a conspiracy theory. Use. Lemon yes. juice makes you invisible. Absolutely, and it does. So... One of the stories that I kind of I, I came across um, when I was writing the book and doing the research was this concept of something called the Dunning Kruger effect. Oh, love it! Yes. So imposter syndrome. So Dunning Kruger. Um, you, you, again, it's very glib generalization. So imposter syndrome, self doubt, says you don't believe in your abilities. You don't believe you're good enough. Dunning Kruger, very glibly and broadly, says you believe in your own hype too much. And you're not stopping to take that safety check. So uh, the, the way it's illustrated, the story I came across it, it was about lemon juice. Now, so the story goes, there was someone in America a few years ago who read somewhere that you can use lemon juice as invisible ink. So again, those of us of a certain generation will have grown up with this, doing it in the summer holidays and with the kind of the annuals we got at Christmas. Anyway, so, and it does work, you know, you kind of get lemon juice and you write and it goes, and then you warm it up and the, the, the colours revealed again. Oh, it's chemistry, okay. chemistry. Anyway, so lemon juice is a form of invisible ink. So this person in America read this and thought, ah, so lemon juice makes things invisible. Not a million miles, not completely misunderstandable. You can kind of get where they were coming from. So they had this idea of, well, if I cover myself with lemon juice, I will become invisible. I can see where this is going. And therefore, if I'm invisible, I can go and rob a bank and no one will know it's me because I'm invisible. So the story goes, they covered themselves with lemon juice. They went to rob a bank and they were very surprised to find that the security guards arrested them halfway through the attempt. I see. And I'd never quite found out and I keep meaning to go back to go, when they covered themselves with lemon juice, did they think this would cover their clothes as well or not? So I'm not quite sure how kind of graphic the story could become. Anyway, but this idea that you've bought into your own hype too much, you've believed your story. And we see this sometimes with certain public figures who think suddenly they can do no wrong because everyone around them is saying, oh, you're great, you're brilliant. That, that's the again, echo chamber. That, that echo chamber going as well. So that, that drowning crew, effect, that's kind of where it's kind of coined and kicked in. Um, but that's, yeah, that's the conspiracy about lemons and why it's good in your tea and your hot toddy if you're not feeling well, but maybe a bit of salads. Um, but otherwise, yeah, don't use it to rob a bank. There are there are other better, safer ways to rob banks. We are very clear about the health warning on that, watchers and listeners. Please do not use lemon juice if you want to be invisible. Before we go, I want to ask mm. you about your annual impact report. Now, if this is something that if, if we really want to demonstrate our self-awareness, doing an impact report on ourselves is something that really demonstrates it very well. So tell us about your impact reports. Okay, so um, about 20 years ago, I fell into self-employment by accident and necessity. That's another long, boring, small violin story. But before that point, I'd started to get involved in cleaning up after bad consultants. We'd gone in, worked with charities and companies, and actually left a bigger mess than when they'd come in. And, and I remember that, that that time thinking, why is this happening? I said, I, I don't think it's because people become consultants or whatever with a view that they're going to be malicious and do damage. Obviously, they get into bad habits along the way. So when I started this life, I thought, what can I do that will help me avoid bad habits? What will keep me on the level? What will challenge me and be self-critical? So this idea of impact reports that says, okay, if I say certain things are important to me about how I work, my relationship with the world, and the you know the, how I work through other people as well, then I need to be accountable for that. I need a kind of an accountability mechanism. Now, that's hard because I'm not employed. I've not got a line manager or a team mm -hmm. of colleagues saying, you didn't do your quotas shift properly. You got to bring in cake for the rest of us. 
So this idea of an impact. So it's kind of loosely based around social impact reporting, social value reporting. So I create, started to create a framework that said, okay, in the, the first year I did it, it had two numbers in it. And the numbers were, uh, what proportion of all my business travel have I done by public transport? Okay. Trying to be sustainable and, you know, respect to that. And how much of my supply chain was I able to do with local businesses, like local within a 10 mile radius of me in terms of su- supporting local economies and building resilience locally? So, that's, so I put it out on my website and that's, and then every year I've tried to add on to it to say, well, what else can I do? What, you know, avoiding complacency. What else can I do? Where can I go with it? So over the years, it's evolved and grown. And when I started, the global goals, the UN's Sustainable Development Goals did not exist. They weren't there. So when they did appear, I kind of waited a year, had a look at them, had to think. And then I started to remap my indicators, my numbers into those goals. So kind of, and that was a really interesting lens. It made more sense of it. And I started to add in more numbers about the impact on people who come on workshops I deliver, numbers about the amount of tax that I pay in terms of transparency and openness. And so it goes. Um, and then short case studies. So I, you know, I don't go out to people and say, you know, please give me a case study for my impact report. Stuff that comes in over there, stuff that people say about me on social media, whatever, so I put it on. And and now what's also important, there's a few things about this impact report as well that I think particularly catches people's interest and attention. Number one, I've, I've done 18 of them now. I think that's the world record for the most number of consecutive annual impact reports on the same organization. I can't find anyone who's come close to that yet. So and they're it's all on a your website? Record. Find it on the website. Um, yeah. I also do it on a side by side, like a financial account. So I go, these are my numbers this year. And these were my numbers last year, just as a set of financial accounts to make sense of them. And I also put on, this is the lifetime average. She can yeah. start to see, is this a blip? And I externally benchmark where I can. So what I found out is there are some numbers like, okay, so tax, for example, what proportion of my income as a sole trader, self-employed freelance business, do I pay in tax? And against that, I can work out what's the amount of tax that a, a typical person would pay on their earnings if they're salaried. So I get a sense of how above or below the line am I in terms of trying to be as good as I can be. If this, I say this thing's important, then how how well am I actually doing compared to what? You know, if we've got no benchmark, we're just blowing smoke. It's done in Kruger all over again and pass the lemons, please, and off we go. Yeah. So that, and then the other thing within it as well that I'm always really keen to point out is I will publish the numbers regardless. And some years, the numbers do not make me look good. Some years, they look bad. But I will put them out regardless because that's important. Yeah, If we're not open about the bad times as well as the good times, then how are we? How can people have trust in us? How can we inspire other people? To, but what I will always do, and from a, an understanding point of view, is when the numbers look bad, I won't just put it out there and find an excuse. I will then say, okay, let me dig deeper. Why does it look bad this year? What's gone wrong? What's changed? Mm-hmm. And what do I now need to start doing differently? What have I let drop either in my own practice that I need to get more honest with? And I'll put it in there. I took my off the ball with this. I need to get better next year. This is what I'm doing. And then in the next year's report, encouraging people to hold me accountable to post stuff. Or actually, in the this was going on in the wider world. So actually, it didn't matter what I did. It was always going to slip. So I don't beat myself up too much. I can be more forgiving of myself to work with it that way. And I always ask people every year, I put it out and I'm always saying to people, what should I, what do you want me to look at next? What is it about me and what I do and how that you want you, that still, you want to scratch away a bit more. So dear listeners, look it up, find it, follow the links wherever it is and go, what's missing? What do you still want to know about me? What dirty secret might I be hiding? I've not let out yet. You know, ask me to put it in there and I'll find a way to, to build out the story more. Listeners, watchers, we will make sure that there is a link in the show notes. And I'm wondering if there is something that all of us could learn in terms of an annual report on our own practice, whether that's our values, our beliefs. Um, Like I've said, I I have a role as a director of a children's charity, but I also host the podcast, have a book, etc. How about an annual report that brings all of those things together to see how they link to values? So maybe we should all be thinking about annual reports on ourselves. We really want to be self-aware. And that point about values is a really interesting one here because I said what prompted it were my values. And then I realized a couple of years ago 
I wasn't actually being explicit in the report about what my values were. So there's now a page, two pages in the book. These are my values. And this is how my business model works. These are how the numbers relate to those values. So we make it tangible. I think very often people talk about values and go, well, what does that mean? It's a woolly fluffy. The more we can show people, here are specific examples. You can touch it, feel it, lick it, smell it. Oh, I get that now. I, they become more impactful. They mean something. And they're actually they're worthwhile. Before we go, tell us the name of your book. Loving Your Doubt. If you've read the book, there's a Facebook group called Lovers of Doubt, if you want to ah, join that as well. So. Amazing. The link will be in the show notes for the Facebook group, the book, and your website and your annual report. Adrian, it's been so interesting and I've learned so much about lemons and imposter syndrome and, and so many other things. Thank you so much for joining me. It's been absolutely brilliant. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for joining me on today's episode where we aim to develop self-aware leaders around the globe to generate kinder, more respectful and creative working relationships through reflection, recognition and regulation. Head over to my website at knowingselfknowingothers.co.uk to sign up to my newsletter to keep up to date with my blog, podcast and book. Looking forward to having you on my learning journey.